Hi everyone, welcome to this part two of the super special March edition of Living Histories. It's a pleasure and honor to host Arpita Upadhyaya from University of Maryland. Uh, without further ado, Arpita, please tell us about Living Histories. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing this wonderful series and for inviting me today to share my story and to you all for being here. So I will start from the very beginning and um, about my early years. So I grew up in a very small town uh, called Rajkampur, Orissa. And you wouldn't really have heard about this town unless you're actually from there or grew up there. And it was basically a cement factory. My father was an engineer and a general manager there. And I just remember growing up in this haze of cement dust that used to be falling all the time. But um, it, it was a fun time. And uh, I remember um, being an avid reader, but being such a small town, there wasn't a whole lot there in terms of resources. We um, had a very small library. There wasn't a bookstore in the town. So we had to drive quite a ways to get to a bookstore. And it was always a treat. I do remember reading and rereading the same books just because I wanted something to read. But I do have in my memory that I was very motivated by my middle school physics teacher. Um, I actually don't remember his name, but I remember his face and he really had a passion for teaching physics. Um, also, my parents uh, were very supportive. My mother uh, was and is a perfectionist. My father was into science and math because he was an engineer, but he encouraged my uh, interest in literature and writing as well. So from there, I went to high school in La Martinia for Girls in Calcutta. And uh, among many other things, we studied physics. Um, I uh, entered the science field. And then I have clear memories uh, of being very inspired by my physics teacher, Ms. Gopa Sen, with whom I'm still a little bit in contact today. And I remember she grading uh, one of my papers, uh, exams, and writing, you have a flair for physics. And that was fun, but she was also very tough and very rigorous. But I really think perhaps she's who started me off in this direction. And um, even when I was thinking about undergraduate, I remember going and talking to her and she encouraged me to follow physics because that was not the usual career path. But I, um, um, I also have, of a fun memory of ending up in a local TV quiz show where we were solving physics problems uh, on live TV. So from there, I went on for my undergrad studies to Birla Institute of Technology and Science uh, in Pilani. And there I developed a love for physics, but uh, I was not that much into biology. And there were many questions I had during my time there, what to follow physics, engineering, um, you know, what would be the career options. So I actually did a double degree in physics as well as electrical engineering, got a job as a software consultant, but that's not really the path I wanted to follow. But then um, we, uh, I ended up applying to grad school. Uh, and, and before uh, that, I did a couple of summer internships on nuclear physics, because that was perhaps the path I was thinking about going in the Variable Energy Cyclotron Center in Kolkata. And that is where I developed um, a love for research and the, you know, the research method. So pursuing physics itself was not seen, seen to be a very lucrative uh, prospect, but my parents were supportive and they allowed me to follow what I thought were my dreams. And off I went from Calcutta to South Bend, Indiana, to study uh, physics at University of Notre Dame. And I arrived there with the proverbial two suitcases. It was quite a bit of a culture shock. And uh, I remember um, that the first winter was really, really tough. So how did I get into biophysics? So my path has uh, taken me uh, from University of Notre Dame uh, to my postdoctoral training at MIT with a few detours along the way. 
during grad school, I went to a workshop um, on physiology at the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole. That's where I learned about uh, many wonderful things about the cytoskeleton, fluorescence imaging, optical tweezers, and many more. And that's perhaps, you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, a fascination that I have to this day. And it may have been instrumental in shaping what I do. I also took a detour and spent, uh, you know, a few months at the Hoku University in Sendai, Japan, because my advisor, James Glacier, had a collaborator there. And I was working on cellular rearrangements in uh, Hydra using green Hydra. It was fun to find those pictures again. And then from there, I went for my postdoctoral uh, postdoc at um, MIT. Along the way, I've had several mentors, collaborators, and colleagues, and have been fortunate to interact with many of them and who are now in different locations. So um, in addition to gaining valuable training and expertise, they've always been supportive of my career trajectories. They've also given me a lot of intellectual freedom to work on different problems that I wanted to pursue both during my PhD and postdoc. And then when I came to uh, UMD, I had several mentors like Ellen, Michael, and Dave, who supported junior faculty and helped to me to make that transition. And currently, I owe a lot to my collaborators and colleagues from whom I've learned a lot, and who as biologists have kept me sort of in the straight and narrow. Oops. So a little bit more about uh, what I actually did. So during my grad school, um, so I, I was at Notre Dame uh, in James Glacier's lab. And in spite of all the obsessions with you know, football and the fighting Irish, uh, the general obsession, we did a lot of science and I got introduced to biophysics. So I was fascinated by the research in, in James's lab. So for my PhD, I worked on understanding how cells with different levels of adhesion would sort out into structured aggregates and in effect, we were thinking about cellular aggregates and by extension tissues behaving like liquids with well-defined liquid-like properties such as interfacial tensions. And this was built on the differential adhesion hypothesis by Malcolm Steinberg. And su this suggested how developmental processes could build upon physical processes to drive patterning. So James, along with uh, Francois Brunner, had published this paper on the POTS model where they extended their work on foams and granular matter to cellular aggregates. And this was almost exactly uh, 30 years ago. There was no experimental validation for it. And that's part of what I worked in my, in my uh, uh, PhD. So what you see actually here are cells from chicken embryos that start out in different um, configurations but end up with the configuration that minimizes the overall interfacial energy. You can see that the time scale here is, it takes about 50 hours. We did not have uh, time-lapse fluorescence microscopes for long-term imaging. So I was the graduate student who was acting like the automatic fluorescence, uh, automatic microscope and taking data over about 48 hours with not a whole lot of sleep, but it was fun. I mean, you know, uh, there's something to be said for kind of sleeping in the lab. But this really fascinated me as a student and allowed me to think about how one can use physics concepts and tools to understand underlying mechanisms of biological processes. And that's how I came into biophysics and started loving it. This was also a pretty tough time because I was in a new lab. So James was the first biophysics faculty to be hired at Notre Dame. And you know, I was getting my hands very dirty and very wet. Um, so, um, and this was before you know a lot of uh, the cell biology revolution that came in. But it was a very gratifying and overall satisfying experience. Interestingly, our work was also featured in a science news, and it was cool to see my name being published about some of the nascent advances of physicists into biology. So for my postdoc, I went to MIT. My path there was also anything but straight. Um, I followed my husband who was doing a postdoc at Brandeis. 
And my path was kind of circuitous over there. I initially started working with uh, Maha, Mahadevan and Roger Kam on computational modeling of fluid um, uh, tissue interactions. But then um, that's not where my heart lay. I knew I really wanted to do experiments. So I met Alexander Van Udenaden somewhat by chance. He had joined the physics department also as the first biophysics hire at MIT. And um, I started attending his lab meetings and eventually joined his lab in Maha moved to Cambridge. So my research there took me deeper into cell biology, uh, into sort of force generation mechanisms in different types of biological contexts based on uh, Actin driven uh, motion, where we studied the movement of uh, vesicles uh, and used them as a proxy to measure forces in cell, uh, in uh, the generated by actin. We also studied the movement of this very cool biological spring, Vorticella, that was funded by DuPont, and also thought about the role of adhesion versus elasticity in growing yeast droplets. Uh, with Michael Brenner, neutrophil migration, and so on. I was fortunate to have a Papalado Fellowship, which gave me the freedom to explore different topics and broaden my interests. Also, Alex's lab really taught me um, it was a fun place with a collective group of people and gave me a sense of how to run my own lab were I to get the chance. So then I decided to join University of Maryland as a faculty member, partly because my husband had a, a faculty position in Duke, and uh, apart from being a very good physics department, it was also just a four hour drive from Duke. And so my early years were spent um, building up a lab, uh, you know, um, and uh, um, setting, uh, setting up biophysics also as the first sort of biophysics hire at UMD. So we can perhaps notice a pattern over here. Um, and this shows you the entrance to our building as you walk into our new building. So it involved a lot of you know, nitty gritty details of setting up the lab, working with contractors, uh, you know, and then setting up a, a wet lab space in a very dry physics department, along with you know, microscopy, et cetera. And during this time, I deferred for a year and went to University of North Carolina to work with Ken Jacobson for about a year. That's where I learned pretty much um, uh, everything I know about live uh, cell imaging with mammalian cells. And I learned a lot of tools that I then started using in my own lab. And I must say Ken was a very generous and kind mentor. During this time, I also uh, benefited from many other colleagues uh, and collaborators. And so I, um, when I started my own lab, um, as a new assistant professor, these are some of the pieces of advice that have kept me going in terms of what problems to follow and to really, you know, give some importance to curiosity. And uh, so in my lab, we have been working on sort of two different directions, but we study the dynamics of cells and molecules and think about simple models to capture the basic underlying mechanisms. The research directions I chose also are partly a matter of uh, serendipity, and we've been talking about science and serendipity to some extent. Very soon after I joined Maryland, there was the um, establish um, the NCI UMD partnership for cancer technology was established, and there through a chance encounter I met Larry Samuelson, and we started working on biophysics of immune synapse formation during T cell activation. I also met Wang Song in the biology department, and we started our work on B cell, biophysics of B cell activation. And more recently, again, by, uh, through a chance meeting with Gordon Hager at one of these symposia, we started working on biophysics of gene expression. And in all of these, the questions that my lab uh, asks are how physical cues, um, how cells sense and respond to physical cues, and how do these shape cytoskeletal dynamics forces, signaling, and gene expression in cells. And these are just a few brief vignettes of some of the things going on in my lab in terms of studying receptor dynamics, fourth generation cytoskeletal dynamics, and uh, mechanosensing in immune cells using a host of different imaging techniques. And more recently, we've been working on um, understanding how um, 
um, gene expression is regulated by the dynamics of transcription factors. So what you can see here is the movement of transcription factors in the nucleus. We can look at the survival distribution of their dwell times and understand something about the rough energy landscape that they must encounter to then give rise to specific sort of broad distribution of binding affinities. And also that these molecules go through different modes of mobility and diffusive states, which tells us something and, um, about how they regulate gene expression. So this is a current work that has gained a lot of, uh, sort of traction in my lab, so to speak, in recent years. And with that, I'm, I'm almost done. <laughs> you wanted us to tell us about some words of wisdom. Uh, so, uh, you know, I already talked about a little bit, but some of these have really stayed with me. One of my mentors said, you just reach for the sun, uh, you know, do the problems that really interest you that you think are worthwhile. You may crash and burn, but perhaps not, and you will have gained immensely no matter what. Follow your nose about which problems that you want to work on. And another one that Alex said, read a paper or two or a textbook before you go to bed every day. You know, who knows what kind of interesting things you might come up with. And again, be curious. Um, also, let your students and mentees have the freedom to follow their own ideas and passions. And finally, believe in yourself. Do not be afraid uh, because, you know, you will succeed in some way or the other, whether or not it's on the initial path that you, you know, set out to do. And what gives me a lot of satisfaction is actually working with young people, you know, new ideas, uh, learning from collaborators and learning something new every day. So outside, um, and, and, and this, uh, I'm, I've just been inspired by this quote uh, by Leeuwenhoek. So in the lab, we study dynamics of molecules, but also in real life, uh, as in biology, in real life, you can also learn a lot by just looking. So when I, uh, wherever I go, I, um, whoops, uh, take a lot of photos. And uh, this is just kind of a, oops, I don't know what happened, Conglom conglomeration of photos that I've taken while commuting, while going to NIH, uh, looking down at puddles, for example. And as a visual person, uh, the photography appeals to me just as imaging appeals to me in biology and biophysics. And with that, I would like to end by expressing a tremendous amount of gratitude for my past and current lab members for accompanying me on this intense but exciting journey. Of course, none of what we're doing now would have been possible without them. And this shows you some of our lab, lab pictures over the years, including the pandemic and hikes we've taken. And um, I would also like to thank my family, my husband, without whose support, uh, I would not be here. It's been critical. And also my son, who uh, continues to delight us with his music and keeps me on my toes with uh, math problems to this day. And uh, thank you all for your attention. And thanks for listening to me. Thanks. Thanks so much, Arpita. Uh, everybody, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, if you have a question, just unmute and ask away. Oh, I see a hand up. Oh, uh, I was just interested to know, like there, the talk is beautiful, but I was super excited to see the image of the immune cell. What cell is that? I'm just, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist myself. That was beautiful. Oh, so those are um, an immortalized T cell line, the, the movies that I showed jerk at T cells. Oh, jerk at, okay. jerk at T cells, yeah. But we've been uh, doing very similar imaging with primary mouse T cells and primary mouse B cells as well. Wow, okay, okay, that's great. Thank you. Sorry, I, 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 I couldn't resist myself. I yeah. Any other questions? All right, go for it. Yeah, uh, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks, I have, a, uh, I have a question about, um, you mentioned that you were either part of um, several labs that were the first uh, biophysics faculty, and you yourself was the first biophysics faculty in, in the right. physics department. 
Um, and uh, that's something that really resonated with me. And I was wondering if you, um, I think it's still, you know, happening today. And I was wondering if you have any advice for people who might be going through the same process, young faculty, for example, joining a department and they're being kind of outsiders in the sense that um, the work that they do. Right, and so I would say that was challenging um, it's a, in both ways, right? So being the first um, uh, in, in, in a very young lab, I think in, both for my PhD and my postdoc, really helped to make me independent. There wasn't like this whole set of things that you could follow, you just have to carve your path out. So in that sense, I felt though it was harder to get the results out quickly. It took longer. Mm -hmm. I think it helped me a lot when I set up my own lab because it kind of felt like the same thing. Uh, and as I said, when I set up my own lab, I started doing sort of new things different from what I was doing in my PhD and postdoc. So that was like doing very, you know, very similar. What I would say is that having a department that has an open mind is very, very important. So I feel lucky. I feel in, in physics, though, we still are a very small biophysics group. My colleagues have a very open mind. So when I've given talks in the department, they're like truly fascinated by what I do. And I've had, you know, particle physicists say, oh, I wish I could do what you were doing. So, so I feel like even though people, um, there is, you know, still some resistance as to what is biophysics, is this really physics, but people have an open mind. And I was told that, you know, that you will learn something new as you're looking into places that nobody has looked at before. And that is sufficient. You don't have to publish in physical review letters, for example. So that, that's what becomes difficult as a new faculty. Like, where do you publish? Where, where will you get the most audience or whether you have to adhere to some stereotypes? So I think it's important to talk to your colleagues uh, and try to get a sense of whether people are open-minded. Thank you. Um, Arpita, I'll end with a question myself. Um, yes, um, I'll, I'll start with the share. So, so I yes, this is an homage to Gopasen from La Martinia for Girls, um, who you do, uh, who you know, who so many of us recognize. Despite being, you know, women from a country of a billion people, there are not so many of us in physics in R1 universities, and yet I can, you know, rattle off many names of people, including former jun Harvard Junior Fellows and people in fancy universities who've all come to physics because Gopasan was their high school teacher. So I wonder what it was about that one experience which was so formative for you. That's really interesting. And I'm trying to think, I, I don't, um, there were definitely, you know, it was a um, um, La Martinia for girls. So there were a lot of girls and some of us um, went into physics. I mean, I just think it was her, um, her love for what she did. And she was extremely outspoken, very, very, you know, determined, but also extremely inspirational. So I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go to physics, whether it would be lucrative, what kind of career I would have. But I remember talking to her after I got my, you know, the board results and she just completely encouraged uh, me to go. So I, I think it was in part her, um, her love for what she did and her, you know, her striving for, for excellence. Like she wouldn't settle for anything less. You, you just had to be really good in, in what you're doing. I think that really made a deep impression on me. And, you know, as a role model, you think, um, you know, part of you is thinking, oh, I wish I could be like her someday, you know, in the back of your mind, you're, you're thinking like that. So it would be fun to meet other people who've gone on to physics careers after having had her as a high school teacher. Actually, I'm not in, no, I, I don't know personally anyone. Sorry, all right. Thank you so much. On that note, uh, everybody please clap again. And um, thank you, Arpita. Thanks a lot, everyone.